another meeting of discussion society of the Harvard Club of Russia. This time we meet with, together with the Duke Club of Russia and with kind support of Duke uh, Foucault School of Business, actually. Uh, so it could be a series of event, uh, maybe with cooperation with other institutions here in Russia, alumni clubs and, and uh, uh, associations of different good people. For example, in this room, uh, some global shakers, global shapers community is presented also of World Economic Forum. Uh, so it's a diverse uh, group of uh, young uh, and social activists. Uh, let me introduce this time, uh, we have a prominent philosopher, visionary, uh, professor of Harvard Law School uh, and ex-minister for strategic affairs of Brazil, who implemented a lot of um, large-scale reforms uh, in the country, and I mean Brazil, and participated in establishing a framework of cooperation between Brazil and Russia uh, as a part of uh, BRICS institutional uh, agenda. Uh, uh, Professor Unger uh, came to Russia to participate at G20 conference and to meet with a number of interesting people uh, and to make a public lecture at High School of Economics tomorrow. It's scheduled in the morning for students uh, and also to see uh, how Russia is changing, uh, how our society uh, is developing or degradating. It depends on point of view and a starting point of uh, counting. Uh, but uh, because Professor Unger was involved in the uh, Russian uh, environment and uh, visited Russia four times <coughs> between 2007 and 2009, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to meet with a yeah, I think it's better maybe I <laughs> see it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, to meet with a number of uh, Russian uh, high official uh, leaders and to discuss um, potential of cooperation between Russia and Brazil. So today's meeting uh, is devoted to the broad topic. We will discuss uh, basically any ideas you would want to share with Professor Unger. Uh, but mostly, my, my suggestion would be to focus on the ways of Russian political and social development. It's a very, very common thing in Russia for generations, I would say, uh, to discuss what is the way we are going to take, what, is the, what, what, what should we do, and how should we develop. In all Russian literature of 19th century and even earlier, we can see that uh, uh, high-profile, uh, prominent writers, authors, would say almost in every piece of, uh, of writing they produce, uh, they would say uh, that the Russian future is ambiguous uh, and unpredictable, as well as our past and uh, even our presence. Uh, in the world is still kind of uh, unstable, uh, shaky reality. So that's why the question, what are we doing in this world? Uh, what is our destination and our destiny? Uh, is the central theme of Russian literature, philosophy uh, and political life, I think, of modern times as well as of the last couple of centuries at least. So uh, regarding format of our meeting, uh, I, I will pass my, actually uh, Professor Unger has his own microphone, so I will uh, pass a, uh, a turn to Professor Unger to make a short introduction, 15 minutes as, uh, as you wish. Uh, and then I will ask my question, uh, Leo Specht, our another guest, a uh, good friend and uh, uh, doctoral student of Professor Unger, uh, who is also uh, participating in all these uh, important meetings we uh, had in Moscow yesterday and we'll have today and tomorrow, uh, and uh, who has a lot of connections with Russia through uh, academ academic collaboration and business. Uh, Dr. Specht uh, was part of our uh, civil code preparation committee, I would say, and uh, 
was a leading expert body for of foreign lawyers who participated as advisors in preparation of Russian civil code through codification period in the 90s and uh, in generally collaborated with the Russian Academy of Science and Sphere of Law uh, in, even in late uh, Soviet times in the 80s, as if I'm not mistaken. And <laughs> yeah, sorry, but uh, it's attracting actually. Uh, so, uh, uh, so and, uh, and now uh, Dr. Specht is a partner at his own law firm called Specht Boehm, uh, which is based in Austria but has a branch uh, in Moscow too, uh, and as well in Kiev uh, as a uh, uh, Eastern European countries. Uh, so then I will pass turn to uh, Dr. Specht to contribute to this introductory speech and ask maybe a couple of questions, and then we'll. Uh, go to the audience for open discussion, for uh, your questions, introductions, if you want notes, and then I think it will take maybe one hour and so, maybe it would be final conclusion, conclusionary speech of uh, Professor Unger. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to have a conversation. And <clears throat> My intention is that it be a conversation and not a talk followed by comments and questions. Uh, now let me begin by suggesting something about the perspective from which I make these introductory remarks. Uh, I believe that none of the fundamental problems of contemporary societies can be solved without institutional innovations. And in particular, innovations in the institutional arrangements that define a market economy, a representative democracy, and an independent civil society. That is not the perspective that prevails in the contemporary world. Uh, we are accustomed to think that a market economy has a predetermined legal and institutional form. The mainstream economists, for example, believe that a market is a market, a contract is a contract, and property is property. We identify representative democracy with certain institutions that have evolved in the modern North Atlantic world. And similarly, we think that an independent civil society has a recognized uh, and undisputed institutional form. Uh, I disagree with these assumptions. Uh, uh, I do not think that the widely professed goal of socially inclusive economic growth can be achieved in the world today without innovating even radically in the institutional form of a market economy. And the reinvention of a market economy can in turn not be implemented without changing our understanding of how independent civil society is to be organized and how democracy is to be, is to be established. Uh, for over 200 years, uh, ideological debate in the world has been dominated by what you could describe as a hydraulic model, focused on the inverse relation between market and state. More market, less state. More state, less market. And then the idea of striking a balance between the market and the state. Uh, what this view fails to recognize is that the market economy itself may take radically different institutional forms. And the same thing holds for independent civil society and for representative democracy. Now, with those uh, comments as background, 
let me suggest four areas of possible discussion among us. The first area concerns the strategy of economic development in Russia and more broadly in the major uh, emerging economies of the world. Now, I, I speak as a Brazilian and uh, as someone who was involved in the discussion of the BRICS and who believes that there are deep analogies among the problems of these major emerging economies. Uh, the specific expression of these common problems in Russia uh, begins in the widely recognized need to uh, establish a strategy of economic development that goes beyond dependence on the production and export of commodities and the extraction of natural resources. So the country has no future if it cannot overcome its dependence on oil and gas and more broadly on uh, primary production. There is then the temptation to imagine that one could superimpose on an economy largely oriented to primary production a high-tech sector. So it's as if you would say we have oil and gas, and then we uh, paste on top of it a Silicon Valley, or many Silicon Valleys. Now, stated in that crude fashion, it's obviously a preposterous idea. Uh, what primary production and high tech have in common is that they are both forms of activity that generate relatively little employment. So this is not a solution for the country not a solution for Russia, not a solution for any of the major BRIC systems. What then uh, should be the strategic idea? What, what sequence of structural transformations would allow the country to go beyond primary production uh, and systematically to, to, to change each, each sector? That's a point of departure for our discussion. Now, a second area is education. If we imagine an economy that is able to innovate simultaneously in many sectors, obviously one of the fundamental requirements is the formation of human resources. In a country that is big, unequal, and federal in structure, like Russia, like Brazil, or like the United States, a first requirement is to reconcile the local management of schools with national standards of investment and quality. And the second requirement is to develop a form of education, a method of teaching and learning that is analytical and problematic in its orientation, rather than characterized by encyclopedic superficiality, by the, the reproduction of memory, of information. So that's a second point of departure. The third point of departure concerns the reorganization of civil society and of the state. And let me, in this third area, just signal two problems as possible focal points for discussion. The first problem is the relation of civil society to the provision of public services. An innovative economy uh, requires high quality public services. 
including services of health and education. Now, we have in the world today two models of the provision of public services. One model could be called administrative Fordism, by analogy to Fordist mass production. It is the bureaucratized provision of standardized, low-quality public services. What I mean by low-quality public services is public services of lower quality <clears throat> than the analogous services that could be bought on the market by people who have money. And the only alternative to this <clears throat> administrative Fordism is the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. But there is reason to think that a third possibility exists and that this third possibility will become increasingly important in the course of the 21st century. The third possibility is the engagement of civil society in the competitive and experimental provision of public services. The state could help organize, equip, finance, and coordinate civil society so that its share in the experimental provision of public services. And that would be not only the best way to enhance the quality of public services, uh, but also the best provocation for the organization of civil society outside the state. A disorganized society cannot develop alternative national futures. Now, here's a second problem that might serve as a starting point for our conversation in this area, civil society and the state. How do we formulate a strategic vision in a contemporary society without relying on the bad old idea of authoritarian planning? Do we have to choose between uh, a Soviet-style idea of a plan formulated by a bureaucracy and imposed top-down, and the notion of uh, passive spontaneity, no plan, no strategic vision? Uh, I'm directly concerned with this issue because in my country, in Brazil, I was responsible for a, a ministry of strategic affairs and long-term planning. Uh, we in our country think of ourselves as being short-termist. There was a, a broadly expressed sympathy for the idea of developing a strategic plan for the country. But no one knew what that meant. And my impression was that my, my fellow citizens uh, thought that uh, strategic planning was like a Soviet idea of planning diluted by 90%, because they had no other conception of what it might be. So here are some elements of a different conception. You have to have a view of a direction, a direction, not a blueprint. And then you have to combine this view of the direction with a tangible identification of the initial steps. In other words, you have to offer a down payment on the direction, a series of measures that can begin a dynamic of movement in that trajectory. Second, you can't start from a priori, from dogmas. You have to start from what already works. Third. Uh, you have to overcome the traditional forms of, of federalism. Uh, the traditional form of federalism that exists in our countries, and I'm talking about Russia, the United States, uh, and Brazil, is a rigid allocation of powers among different levels of the federation. Now, it turns out that the solution to all the major problems in, of these large countries depends on cooperation 
among the different levels of the Federation. We therefore need to invent a form of cooperative federalism. And we need to allow particular sectors or territories in a country to deviate from the general solutions and create counter models of the future. So it's like this, a society goes down a certain direction, but it hedges its bets. And in choosing a particular direction, it also generates a series of counter models to that dominant direction. It's not enough for these counter models to be abstractions. They have to have some tangible expression. A fourth characteristic of this other idea of strategic planning is that it can't be the product of some enlightened bureaucratic apparatus. It has to be co-authored by all the parts of the state with the active engagement of civil society. Now, I had this experience in, in government, uh, that the exercise of power is almost invariably tainted by paranoia. So everyone is afraid of revealing any measure of divergence of disagreement in the government. The government produces its plan secretly and then imposes it as a diktat upon society. And obviously, that idea of strategic planning is incompatible with this notion of a, 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 a national experiment by trial and error. So we need a form, a way of developing a strategic vision that openly reveals divergence, disagreement, the dialectic, and engages the different parts of the government and of society in the formulation of the plan. And the fifth characteristic of this alternative idea of strategic planning is that it can't be conceived simply as a plan of the government that happens to be in power. It shouldn't be a plan of the sitting government. It should be a plan of the state. And that means that it it has to be sustained and developed by a consensus among the major political forces in the country. The objective is to survive the present government, to, uh, to create a loose consensus in the country that has some staying power. Uh, now, I've described three areas of possible conversation among us. The strategy of economic development to go beyond primary production. The formation of capabilities through the radical reformation of education. The reshaping of civil society and of the state, and in particular, of the idea of strategic planning reinterpreted along the lines that I've just suggested. Now, here's a fourth area of possible conversation. And that has to do with the relation between these strong national projects, projects that have an institutional content, and the present organization of the world system, and in particular, of the world economy as in the global trading regime. Uh, now, here's a thesis just to provoke conversation in this fourth area. The thesis is that the world political and economic order that has developed since the Second World War is characterized by what you could describe as an institutional maximalism. That is to say, 
it tends to impose on all the countries in the world the acceptance of a certain institutional repertory or blueprint as a condition of access to the global public goods of political security and economic openness. Let me give you the example of the WTO treaties. Uh, the WTO treaties tend to incorporate into the rules of free trade not just the commitment to the market economy in the abstract, but the adherence to a very particular version of the market economy. For example, they outlaw under the label subsidies all the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries now rich use to become rich. So they become rich, and then, as they say, they kick away the ladder. Another example, they incorporate into the rules of free trade the regime of intellectual property, which is a relatively recent invention of the late 19th century and has the effect of leaving most of the technological innovations of greatest importance to humanity in the control of a handful of private multinational businesses. So maybe what we should desire instead of this institutional maximalism is an institutional minimalism. The greatest degree of economic openness with the least restraint on the institutional experiments that can be conducted within particular national economies, including experiments in the way of organizing a market economy. Now, we know for a fact that it's possible to organize the world economy on such a basis because the regime that preceded the WTO, the regime of the GATT, was characterized by an institutional minimalism of exactly this kind. So the idea would be within each major economy in the world, radical institutional experimentation. Experimentation in the form of a market economy, of a civil society, and of a democracy. And in the world, an order that reconciles openness, economic openness, with a margin of maneuver, a world order that is hospitable to deviation, to heresy, to alternatives, to experiments. Now, how would such a world order arise? It would, could only arise through pressure from below. That is to say, if major countries like Russia and Brazil commit themselves to programs of institutional innovation, and then discover that these institutional innovations contradict the limits imposed by the present world order. And then we can have a transformation. Then we can, we can overthrow this, this Metternichian project that the great powers have uh, imposed on the world in the name of political security and economic openness. So there you have a suggestion about about four areas of conversation. Important uh, in, in your context, in the Russian context. And I would like to take up two, not ideas, but perhaps terms, and uh, briefly uh, elaborate on them. The first is normalcy. 
the entire post-Soviet history, to the extent I understand it, is a struggle with the idea of normalcy. So the narrative would be the Soviet Union was something not normal, it was an exception to what history actually dictates uh, as a normal path of development. And then there is this realm of normal countries and everything you should aspire for is becoming part of this realm. Now, um, Alexei was so friendly to remind me of the fact that I'm old enough to having seen uh, all kinds of um, people, characters, and attempts in the late Soviet and early post-Soviet context of bringing the country in line with what was perceived at this normalcy. There were some funny events like a member of the then Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union coming to Harvard and expressing his, con his, his opinion that the future of socialism is the supermarket. And there were tragic events like what happened uh, with so-called radical liberal experimentation in Russia after 1991. But it was all driven by the idea that there is this normalcy, you should be part of it, and if the country suffers enough, if the shock is deep enough, at a certain point in time, you will be, you have, will have crossed this, this river and on the other side, there is this normalcy. Now the normalcy is gone. Um, in Europe, particularly one of the realms, the examples were taken of, there's a deep crisis. And it's not only an economic crisis, it's an institutional crisis, it's a political crisis. And it is a crisis which in its periphery partly takes forms which your country was familiar with in the 90s. So children who cannot go to school, old people who uh, cannot live from their retirement payment, public services which simply collapse, not in Germany, not in Austria, but in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, etc. So I think it is time to overcome this idea that there is uh, this future uh, which is uh, to be described or understood as the participation uh, of Russia in, uh, in the realm of normalcy. And the second idea, or the second term, I would briefly want to address, and it's related, and for Russia, I think, uh, particularly uh, important is the idea of experiment and experimentation. The idea of deviation from the path to normalcy was mostly <coughs> discredited with the term experiment. If you read about the Soviet Union, particularly Russian literature about the Soviet Union in the 90s, then Soviet experiment was a particularly negative term. Now, leave aside Soviet, I'm concerned with experiment. The idea that people can try something different and something new is strongly rejected and has been strongly rejected in this country for 10 or 15 years. And the kind of experiment which we see now in place in Russia as a government program as official politics contributes to the disc discreditation <coughs> of the idea of experiment because they themselves describe them as a kind of experiment within uh, the realm uh, of, uh, uh, within the system of world economy they aspire to be part of. So I would like to kind of sharpen your instincts and, uh, uh, and, 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 and plead that we reach out uh, to not narrow the horizon, but that our visions kind of broaden it to the extent not only possible but necessary. Maybe let's go to questions. It would be easier. Well, it's not questions. It's yeah. well, <laughs> one is a discussion. As people, yeah. people should say what they think and now shape the discussion. 
So is anybody brave to start it? So the word that stuck there was tragic. So the restructuring in the 90s was tragic. Very interesting, very different. It seems to be sort of like a philosopher's dream to think about what would you do if your you know, uh, continental union completely changed. Uh, so how would you do uh, privatization differently? How would you, what other ideas could we have? Or maybe if you don't answer that question, what's going to happen with Europe? And how would you like run it in the morning if there was a massive crisis and it had to happen right now? What would you do differently? What would you, um, what would you do? Well, you're, are, are, are you asking a question or is it a rhetorical question? Which I'm kind of asking a question. Mm -hmm. I'm, from, I'm from Ireland, so I've got uh -huh. uh, interest in this. But let's say if um, everybody just in the European countries realizes that the books won't balance anytime soon, what would you do from, um, let's say you're Germany, uh, or let's say you're whoever's in charge in, in Brussels, what would you do on a simply ideological level to start um, coming up with some new ideas? Well, uh, um, <clears throat> let me try and respond in a way that takes the conversation back to Russia, since, since that's, that's the, immediate, the immediate context. Here are two, two themes that might help shape the development of a project. So the first theme is the nature of the economy that is emerging in the world after what we call Fordist mass production. So in the 20th century, the dominant industrial paradigm was the large-scale production of standardized goods and services with relatively rigid machines and production processes and semi-skilled labor. So that's the, what, what we conventionally call heavy industry. But it's uh, really this, this idea of rigid Fordist mass production. Now we see in all the major economies of the world, the emerging economies as well as the rich North Atlantic economies, the development of a new style of production. And it's not correct to characterize this new style of production as simply uh, high technology or idea dependent. It's much more than that. It's a set of methods. It is a form of production that shortens the distance between conceiving things and making them that relativizes specialized work roles, that attenuates the contrast between conception and execution, and that mixes together cooperation and competition in the same domains of activity. It's an experimentalist vanguardism in production. And its general tendency is to turn the best businesses into something that is more like the best schools. Production becomes a form of permanent innovation. Now, the trouble is that these new forms of production are largely quarantined within relatively isolated advanced sectors that are weakly linked to the rest of the national economy. And the vast majority of the labor force in the richer economies, as well as in the poorer ones, is excluded from these advanced sectors. So then a crucial question becomes, how can the gateways of access to these new productive vanguards be, be opened? So that it's not just the Silicon Valleys. So that it's not just the advanced small and medium-sized businesses in Catalonia or in Southwest Germany. So that these advanced productive practices are disseminated through a large part of the national economies. 
Now, it seems that you can't do that. You can't advance toward that objective without a series of institutional innovations. Institutional innovations in the relation between governments and firms, and institutional innovations in the relations among firms. So it's the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. Now, take the vertical axis. We have now in the world two main models of relations between government and business. We have the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government. And we have the Northeast Asian model, the model of the tiger economies of Asia, of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. Neither of those two models is adequate for the purpose of disseminating a post-Fordist economy throughout a large part of the production system. We would need something else. We would need a form of strategic coordination between governments and firms that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. Its main method would not be subsidized credit. It wouldn't be picking winners, choosing the right sectors. The main method would be finding out what works and disseminating it, and giving access to credit, technology, and advanced practice. And the main beneficiaries of this access would not be big businesses. They would be small and medium-sized firms. It's the small and medium-sized firms in every national economy that are responsible for the vast majority of output and of employment. And economic revolution then means bringing up a larger part of this mass of small and medium-sized businesses to the frontier of advanced practice and advanced technology. My question, it's not a question, but the response is, how can you have so much um, activity and, um, let's say, on, the, on the small, to, small to medium businesses, how can you have so much um, just freedom for them with this top-down model of control? You can't, you, um, how can you you can't do it through a top-down model. That's what I'm saying. You can't, you, can't, you can't choose between the American model and the Northeast Asian model. You need something else. And, this, and these innovations on the, what I'm calling the vertical axis, might be combined with innovations on the horizontal axis. That is, you, 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 you might want to promote, among small and medium-sized businesses, regimes of cooperative competition so that they can compete against one another and cooperate at the same time, pooling resources and achieving, through this pooling, economies of scale. Now, actually, although this idea is, uh, is, I'm describing it in a 21st century vocabulary, was the basis of the development of agriculture in the 19th century. American agriculture was developed through this combination of decentralized partnership between governments and family farmers and cooperative competition among the farmers. It's just that we don't have a developed example of this paradigm in industry as opposed to agriculture. Uh, but there you have a, a, an initial set of examples of what it would mean to begin changing the institutional character of the market economy. It's not just regulating the market. It's not just compensating for the inequalities generated in the market through retrospective tax and transfer. It's reshaping what a market economy is in its institutional content. Now, let me suggest a second focus of this, uh, of this issue, of this idea of institutional innovation in the market, the relation of finance to the real economy. The world has just been through a major financial crisis, helping to provoke a, a, a crisis in the real economy. And you see that the debate in the world is almost entirely dominated by two themes, both of them superficial. First theme is the need for stimulus, vulgar Keynesianism. 
And the second theme is the regulation or re-regulation of finance. But there is almost no discussion in the world of the basic structural issue of the relation of finance to the real economy. In all the market economies in the world today, the production system is largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. All empirical studies have, that have been done show that the vast preponderance of the financing of production is internally generated in the production system itself. Now, this simple observation then leads to the disturbing question, what then is the point of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets? Theoretically, it's to finance the productive agenda of society. In fact, the, the preponderance of financial activity has only an oblique or episodic relation to the financing of production. So it's as if in good times, finance is largely indifferent to the real economy, and in bad times, it becomes destructive. Instead of being a good servant, it's a bad master. And then we have to ask, well, does it have to be this way? Could we, how could we, through a series of institutional innovations, enlist finance in the service of the real economy? For example, through tax and regulatory changes that discourage financial activity not related to the expansion of production and the enhancement of productivity and encourage the financial activity that is. Or by mobilizing some of the vast saving of society accumulated in the pension systems to make it available for the undone work of venture capital, investment in emergent enterprise. Uh, that's a whole other frontier of of institutional innovation in the form of the market economy. Now, here, here's then the, the thesis that, that I offer for discussion. The, the thesis is that if we take a project like the project of overcoming dependence on primary production in an economy like the economy of Russia, we cannot solve the problem by simply pasting on to primary production a high-tech sector. We can solve the problem only through a sequence of institutional innovations like these that I've just described. These, these, these change, this reinvention of industrial policy, not as a practice of picking winners, but as a, as a practice of expanding opportunity and capability. Or these innovations that are designed to enlist finance in the service of the real economy. That's the path. But that path is immensely more complicated than the simple idea of reallocating resources. It requires an institutional reinvention. And the institutional reinvention depends on ideas and the ideas are not yet there. Just a second, if you don't mind. Uh, we have here, uh, I want to give it uh, just a chance to speak because um, Alexander has to, to, to leave us. And Alexander, I want just to present him here shortly, is director at the Agency of Strategic Initiatives, which was established by President Putin uh, a year ago. A bit, a, bit, a, bit, a, bit, a bit early, yeah, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, basically, this agency is designed uh, to promote uh, small and medium enterprises uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation with government through infrastructure uh, support. And uh, they drafted a number of uh, roadmaps for sectoral uh, development and for you know, general change of uh, legal framework for uh, businesses, uh, for business regulations. So, uh, because Alexander has to, to leave like, shortly. If you don't mind, I give him a voluminous presentation.
Yeah. Uh, and uh, Arsen asks to opportunity to talk, maybe to discuss particular mm -hmm. uh, suggestions of yours in in sense of implementing them into a Russian context. Because uh, actually yesterday, when President Putin made the speech about development of certain uh, certain sectors of Russian industry, he basically mentions this very similar ideas about uh, uh, cooperative efforts for small and medium enterprise businesses uh, to modernize Russian industrial uh, potential in aerospace, uh, uh, shipbuilding industries, and some others, which are, this is approach is quite different from what we had before as industrial policy based on huge state-owned enterprises. So it, it's kind of interesting correlation between your words and what was said yesterday. So, But if you don't mind, uh, because Roberto has the tendency to speak uh, uh, not in, in an abstract way, but speaking about ideas, uh, and very often this is then brushed away, and you know the real life is different, etc. We, we know all this. Let me give you an example, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity of kind of now addressing you. Um, Austria. There is a region in Austria which manufactures more cars than are manufactured right now in southern Germany, and there is no Austrian car brand. Why? Because <coughs> not the genius of government, but certain developments within regional administrations led to the building up of a car manufacturing cluster in Styria. Styria is one of the regions in Austria. This car manufacturing cluster consists of two, three bigger companies, which are affiliated mostly with the uh, international group of Magna, and around it Dozens of small businesses have sprung up and the manufacturing takes now place in the form of organized cooperation amongst these small businesses, turning out all kinds of first, and this is the primitive example, spare parts, etc., which are then modeled or put together in Slovakia or wherever, plus inventing new elements of cars, so new engines, uh, new ways of uh, reducing uh, uh, reducing the, uh, the the amount of uh, uh, of uh, uh, carbon which is used, etc., etc., etc. Now, this sector employs right now around the city of Graz, which is the capital of the region, 85,000 people. It's huge by Austrian standards. I mean, Austria is this small country, it's half of Moscow, yeah? 85,000 uh, employees in more than 80 companies. But it's forming together a cluster, and the brain is not any longer Magna. Magna is the infrastructure. It's a, it's a big business as infrastructure for small businesses. The brains are in the small companies many of which have programs of cooperation with the Technical University of Graz, with the Technical University uh, of, uh, uh, of Vienna, uh, with etc., etc., etc. So these are very specific examples which help us uh, understand uh, the broader idea of innovation and experimentation with the effect that an entire set of manufacturing, which in, within a region which was always an industrialized region of Austria, has changed. Now the irony, and forgive me for, for, for addressing you in this direct way, the irony is that the former chairman of Magna Europe huh? now working in Russia. is now working in Russia, running a gas company. and he is not referring to this very successful model, but he is speaking as the representative of big corporate manufacturing, which is actually not, not, not the cause for the, for the success. So what I'm trying to tell you is be very careful 
in analyzing these, uh, these examples and try not to be disencouraged from the general notion or from the big concept because there's so much of real life experience, experience behind it. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting, provocative four points. Uh, my name is Ruben Vardanian. I'm the, one of the business uh, leaders in investment banking industry and I'm also founder of the business school of Skolko. It was founded seven years ago by private initiatives. Um, I want to speak about the probably your four subjects, like two public sector and uh, education. I think one of the issues with education, which I think is becoming a key challenge for not only for developing countries like Russia, but also for the United States, the United States is facing serious challenges. It's spending trillions of dollars of yes. uh, investing in education and yes. yeah, facing a big challenge, you cannot achieve very good results. And I think <coughs> analyzing what's going in the education industry is becoming very critical, especially in the 21st century, where the people becoming main assets. In, in my opinion, <coughs> Entire model of education, especially business education, under big crisis because the model was established after Second World War. It was the demand of the marketing, finance, knowledge was very big, and this was by established by case study and the way how you can share information using some of the uh, cases which was developed in uh, developed countries. But in emerging markets, all the cases are irrelevant. The information is not is hidden. You cannot get real information what's going in the company. You cannot get real analysis was going in the most of the countries like China or Russia because most of the information is not public and becoming the question what kind of information, what kind of knowledge, what kind of the exper exp expertise you're trying to provide the people who need to become business people, especially when you're not touching the key subjects which is becoming very critical in reality like corruption or like other issues which in the business schools is illegal right, or people don't want to touch it. You're saying it's not the part of our education program despite the reality will be different for the people who graduate the schools. And this, I think, is one of the key points of the, where is the line between the practical experience and the theoretical knowledge which needs to be linked with emerging markets, especially like Russia. Where is the lot of issues which is not established enough in a long time and we don't have enough ex uh, timing for doing this deep analysis and make some conclusions. And how you can really help this theoretical knowledge from the United States will be transferred to Russia and will help people become successful because in end business school, it's not the students for just graduating and getting diploma. It's business schools are helping people become successful in the business, making money. And if you look at the numbers today, most of the people who graduate most of the best schools in the world. Coming to Russia is not becoming very successful. They've been attracted by some corporates, but they've not been really leaders of the transformation of the country. And the question of what needs to be done and how it needs to be changed, I think it's a good question from Russia, from uh, current situation, especially with your we're not enough uh, resources demographic anyway. We have a crisis in demography. But uh, my key point about this uh, education, I think it's education needs to become pretty different. Like in New York, I was really surprised. In New York, the government spending 12.1, 12.5 trillion dollars for education. Uh, totally just 12.5 billion dollars in education. Making this efficient education, it will be bring immediately different um, results. Compare the charity with the, the, the whole private money with charity collecting is a 1.2 billion dollars a year. Basically, 10% efficiency in the education system in New York will bring 2.5 billion dollars or 12.5 billion dollars additional. Uh, as I say, the education will need to become uh, seriously reorganized and become more public-private partnership. It cannot be just treated like the public sector. And efficiency of the education will become critical for any success of the country for future. And this is why I think that whatever happening in South Korea, India, or in uh, Singapore, it's a very good example of the, or Finland, where is the special system exists, where is the education becoming key industry from the respect, not only from my name, but also for respect. The teachers in Finland much higher respected compared to any other profession. And, and I think one of the things that needs to be transferred is the model of education, the public-private partnership model, it needs to be better develop, and more importantly, the position of the teachers and their reputation of the education industry needs to be reestablished re entirely in the society, otherwise we will not be successful. And the other point I want to just raise a little bit uh, very quickly is about the public sector and the role of the long-term planning. I've been privileged to know Lee Kuan Yew, Minister Mentor of the Singapore, and he joined our board of the school, and I asked him why he joined being 85 years old in the school of, didn't exist in the time when he joined, it was just in my dream. He said, because in um, 20 years' time, Mumbai and, and Shanghai will be more competitive compared to Singapore, and uh, Singapore will lose the competitive advantages, we need to develop the 
uh, relationship with the countries with the seven hours uh, distance from Singapore, I asked him, what is your plan? What's your vision about uh, Singapore? How long are you trying to plan the future of Singapore? It's eight years. Now, say we, we're speaking about the planning and you know, how bad the Soviet system was about planning, but we have a China, which for 5,000 years was being empire, was provided the system of the planning, bureaucracy, very hierarchical system. I'm not saying it's a system that I want to live. I'm not saying it's a model that I, in the country that I want to be, but at least it proved by 5,000 years that the model can exist and can be quite efficient, self-sufficient and can be uh, quite uh, well established for the country. I'm not saying about for maybe ordinary people, we can discuss about how life in China for ordinary person is good or bad, but I'm just saying the model what you're trying to criticize is not the same in any in different country because it's a very linked mentality, yeah. linked with uh, some different model, like Japan and China. I think it's a very good example of absolutely different mentality, different model, different behavior. And so I've been doing analysis about democracy and uh, public and private uh, uh, initiatives, how the private needs to be more involved, how public needs to be uh, privatized. I think it's very important and also the mentality of the people and nations who are living. So why Russia, being in between, between Asia and Europe, always been struggling between which model we are trying to be. So why we've been always trying to get two models simultaneously, which is the worst case scenario, because the best is we have one model, doesn't matter which one, but we'd be consistent. What we have in our country, unfortunately, has always been trying back and forth, back and forth. We are part of Europe, Europe but we're also part of Asia. And I think one of the key challenges today for all the countries like um, in Europeans or in, uh, in Russia or Brazil, is find, to find the model which really fit with the mentality, fit with the, whatever we are trying to do today, also for the future and the past. Because the past is also showing, like the Greece is a very good example. The Greece was bankrupt. The last thousand years, the Greece was insolvent or bankruptcy 850 years. Okay? 850 years from the last 5,000 years, Greece was in a bankruptcy or insolvency, and the public's always no been good business model of the country producing some products for the growth. Okay, a European community decided to incorporate Greece as part of the EU because it was a political decision, not by the economical numbers. Now we're paying price for this, okay? It was by decision, but basically it was clear decision by done by political, not economical reasons. So I say we're looking the we need to look the past very, I think, deeply and understanding what's going in the past, because it will be very well connected to the Russia, to Brazil about the past, like experimental issue. We've been experimented. Russia was the most experimented country because we did a revolution and tried to build a socialism in a one country, which was not possible. That's why we've been a very, very high risk taking country, but we destroyed the people who've been very high risk taken in it during the Soviet time because we've been very nervous about to be extreme again. So I'll say we uh, need to be very uh, well more informed about what's going in the countries, what is part of the country, what's the culture difference, and what's the um, issues which be very specific. Like I, I like the Spengler. I think the Spengler was trying to analyze was all it well it's connected to each other, not only mathematics, philosophy, economical model, behavior, because it's all linked to each other. It cannot be separated. You cannot put democratic you know, standards to China and say this is the as soon as China will become democratic, this will be the new era of the China. I'm not sure maybe the country will be destroyed because of the model will be not accepted by society and will bring very big problems for the country. Because just trying to implement democratic principle in China, I'm not sure is the best way to change China for the uh, future. Thank you. Uh, professor, thank you so much for, I mean, what was, I think is taking very high pitch in our dis discussion. And um, you know, thank you for a very profound insight. If you could just echo what, what Ruben is saying. Um, I think one word that we need to really highlight um, and, and focus on is the word competition. Because that escaped our, our discussion, but at the, end, at the end of the day, you know, where it comes to sort of building institutions, building the right structure, building the right innovative process. At the end of the day, all of this is a result of the competitive process, right? So I think the real question is how can we stimulate the competitive forces in the Russian economy? I think to me that's cornerstone part of the discussion. Um, I, I would disagree with your take on the primary production versus high-tech industries, right? I think at the end of the day, we need to be solving for development of the industries uh, that are globally competitive, right? As in the case of Brazil, fine, it's offshore oil production, it's a globally competitive industry that's developing and forcing the rest of the economy to develop quite efficiently, right? You know, with its constraint, but still, it does. Same for Russia, oil and gas is, um, you know, called natural resources, is a globally competitive industry, right? And uh, it's not capital intensive, you know, it could be labor intensive as well. If you look at examples of some of the other countries, say, 
you know, US, small mid cap, um, you know, gas sector. So to me, it's, it's about uh, creating an incentive for competitive development in the industry you know, of the country, right? Uh, with focus on globally competitive industries, right? Now, obviously, the key constraint that we need to be solving here, and I think in Russia it's particularly acute, is the constraint of um, uh, fostering competition in a way that does not undermine the fundamental institutional stability of the country, right? Uh, um, and uh, that's a key, key, key trade-off, and I think this is what, in many ways, what Ruben is saying in terms of democratic values, China, et cetera, et cetera. It's not about the choice of model. It's about finding the right balance between fostering competition and institutional stability and development as a second objective. Now, w where it comes to Russia, I think there are two key conclusions we'd like to, 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 to make, right? I mean, first, uh, if you look in retrospect and some of the decisions that were made before, I think Russia was obviously wrong in making decisions uh, on large-scale, um, high-caliber privatizations, right? You know, um, the right decision would have been to uh, privatize, you know, mom-and-pop shops to create a sector and class of risk-taking entrepreneurs, right? That well, was unfortunately absent due to, due to many constraints of the Soviet time. So the, the, the right thing is to develop small mid-cap sector uh, in globally competitive industries. Um, and that's, that's really a key thing. And secondly, you know, uh, that obviously needs to be, uh, again, you know, done in clear coordination with uh, educational development. You know, education is of disproportionate value. Um, you know, but it's not only the education of uh, business leaders. I mean, to me, it's uh, educational Fordism, if you, if, 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 you, if you will, right? I mean, it's about, you know, high school, college education of basic professions that will allow us to create this class of uh, mid-cap, small-cap entrepreneurs because they will be the driving force for creation competition for ideas, for capital, for technology, for the rest of the things in this country, right? And. Um, that's really the, 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 the equation for which we need to be solving. Um, and that, as such, that will be a sufficient uh, guide for all the strategic planning that we need to do in this country. So that's, that's, that's my take on things. If, if you allow me, again, thank you for, for taking what is a very high pitch in this discussion. Thank you. I just have uh, two questions. So first is, um, can we build innovative institution without building basic institutions? So skipping the part of building traditional European institutions, you know, and to jump from that model to something different and innovative. is the first question. And the second question, and can we institutionalize the change of institutions? So some institutions, specifically political institutions, uh, were made like to serve for years and to, to, to like build a framework for cooperation for years, for ages. And now we see that you know the challenges are different, the distribution of wealth is different, so these institutions probably should be changed. But there is not a stable way without any house, without any breaking uh, the basics to change these institutions. So is there any way, uh, do you think, to do that? Like, for example, referendum every 10 years that will challenge the basic uh, basic uh, postulates, even in constitution, even in political organization, even in redistribution of power, or that's not possible at this point? So uh, just, just take that issue. Um, <clears throat> we've been speaking about the institutions of the market, but there are also the institutions of democracy. The democracies of the North Atlantic world, the rich industrial democracies, are on the whole organized in such a fashion that in, in them, change is only possible when there is crisis. So for example, the American constitutional arrangements were designed by Madison and his contemporaries to inhibit the political transformation of society. So in, in, in the American constitutional system, there is a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power. And there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. The Madisonian scheme of checks and balances was deliberately designed to make it difficult to produce change through politics. So, for example, in the 1930s, in Franklin Roosevelt's time, 
Roosevelt had a war and a depression as his allies. And even then, he had tremendous difficulty in introducing structural change, because the system was designed that way. The Americans believe that the liberal principle and the conservative principle are inseparable. But they're mistaken. They're not inseparable. They were combined by design. They were combined deliberately. Uh, what I think is that in our societies, in, in countries like Brazil and Russia, we need political institutions that facilitate repeated structural change and that do not make change depend upon crisis. And so the, the, the idea that institutional innovation in the form of the market or of democracy is a luxury that it's a kind of maximalism, that first we have to achieve the threshold in order later to aspire to something else, seems to me to be incorrect. We need institutions that make innovation in the economy and in politics more accessible. And we can't do that by simply imitating the institutions that prevail in these rich North Atlantic societies. Let me follow up with this, uh, on this with a question. You said European institutions. You spoke about European institutions. But I happen to be a European. I don't know what European institutions are. I did not know before the crisis, the so-called crisis. And that now I, I know it even less. Let me give you an example. You have, you have heard for, uh, uh, about the European stabilization mechanism. The European Union has never been a system within which executive power <coughs> was democratically legitimate, never. The European Parliament plays a rudimentary role. I'm, I'm not saying a peripheral role, a rudimentary role. It's a kind of sentimental idea that in, 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 uh, in Europe, decision making would need a democratic legitimation. All the constitutional, so-called constitutional changes after this one did not really add much to the power of the parliament. So you could say uh, it is an executive-driven institution in European Union. Now they add on to this the ESM. The discussion in Europe about the ESM is solidarity. Don't be against the ESM in Austria, in Germany, in nowhere, because the Greeks need our help. But if you then read not the, the small print, but the treaty, then you get something totally different. You get a non-accountable system of executive power of, and now I'm, I know that uh, I'm going to be uh, on record, with an authoritarian, with an authoritarian principle. And it is supposed to be a system which is taken from the internal constitution of the Bretton Woods institutions, but it is not. It adds on to this. So the Bretton Woods institution have always benefited from immunity of their collaborators. The ESM goes a step further. Not only the collaborators are immune, and they are immune for lifetime, but those who cooperate with the ESM. So the accountants, the lawyers, Everyone who is contracted to provide services within the realm of the engagement within, uh, is, is now rendered immune for his or her actions and its actions um, by the ESA. So I, I'm not really clear what we are speaking about. The Austrian parliament, the French presidency, the ESM. But I can tell you that I see that there's more and more a narrowing of alternatives. We are not expanding on the democratic side of institutions. We are not expanding on the participatory side of institutions. We are always expanding from the other side of these institutions. So I do not need, see any reason for you to be romantic about this, first. And second, to believe that this is the springboard from where to de develop something new. By, by saying broadly European, and I would say it's probably 
of your, uh, it's better to say Western institution, just meant very basic things like rule of law, private property, you know, democracy. Let's say, I mean, when you mentioned the word referendum, I think that's fantastic. There's not enough referendums in Europe about staying in or getting out, and, and a, lot, a lot of people want to have, you know, their sovereignty back. Can't have it. There's no chance to have a referendum. If you, if you uh, try and opt out, um, you'll be given another referendum until you vote yes. And this happens in Ireland all the time. You're, you know, you have uh, for Lisbon, people vote no, you vote no, okay, we'll have another referendum. Now everybody vote yes. And, and it becomes very... Uh, I just think that, um, I know the topic of discussion is Russia, but the Russian uh, uh, privatization process happened, and, and Europe is going to have a similar fall soon. And I just, um, I just I, I'd love to try and get that question answered again. Like, what can happen? How can you fix it? How can, what would you do? So there, there, there's, an, there's an underlying uh, 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 a division in a in a conversation like this, and let me let me try and frame the division. So, um, it's one thing to organize an economy efficiently, so that it can uh, use established comparative advantage. For example, we in Brazil have a great advantage in agriculture. Uh, in the production of commodities. And uh, our progress in recent years has been largely dependent on, again, primary production, production and export of commodities. And mining and, and agriculture with, uh, 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 for markets such as China. It's an entirely different thing to design an economy that is able to create new comparative advantage. That's a higher level of ambition. In education, it is one thing to create an educational system like the Korean or the Japanese that produces disciplined students who master the established body of knowledge uh, and are uh, obedient workers. It's an entirely different thing to create an educational system forming people who are able to criticize uh, and to innovate in the realm of ideas. That's, that's, that's a higher level of ambition. In politics, it's one thing to design a democracy that can be stable and then wait for the next crisis to make change possible. And it's an entirely different thing to create a democracy that doesn't need crisis to produce change. So there's the lower level of ambition and the higher level of ambition. And now we come to the division. It's a division which you could describe as the division between minimalism and maximalism. So the minimalist position is First, we have to achieve the lower level of ambition to then aspire to the higher level of ambition. It's not reasonable to seek the higher in any of these domains if we haven't even achieved the lower. Now, I, I, I reject that position. And my view is that in our countries, we have to have the maximalist ambition, that we have to pass from a situation which is below the minimum to the aspiration to the maximum. And I understand that that's, that that's a, a more contentious thesis. But in a sense, that's the most important underlying theme in this, in this conversation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to first thank our honorable guests for their speeches. Uh, my name is Alexei Potemkin. I'm from the Moscow State University PhD student. And I want to talk about the things, um, not the thing that people actually do, but about the things that drive people to do things. Um, that was yesterday when Vladimir Putin, Russian president, addressed uh, the Federal Assembly and um, talked about the civil society of the Russian Federation. And he told that um, the civil society of Russian Federation should 
be developing and the Russian democracy should be developing in, uh, in, in a very conservative way, um, which, is, um, which considers Russian culture, Russian history, and Russian traditions. Um, and I personally strong, uh, strongly convinced that the ideas that Samuel Huntington or Gabriel Almond or Sidney Verba outlined about the political culture are um, quite truthful. They've div divided political cultures in three, I would say, sectors. The parochial culture, which means that people in the country don't have any idea of what the government does and what the po politics is. The subject culture, um, in which people know what the government does, but they don't participate in this culture. And the participant culture, in which um, the civil society really participates in uh, governing the country. Um, I think that the Russian history has left a mark on the Russian people. I, I mean the history of Tsarism, the Soviet Union, uh, the beginning of the 90s with this uh, liberal anarchy. Um, and this has left a mark and um, people came to what they have now, to the stability under the President Putin. Um, and I'm just, as a young, as a representative of the younger generation, I was uh, quite involved in the student self-governing in Russia. And I see that uh, the Russian younger generation is lacking activity. It's very passive. And um, there are two ways for Russian, let's say, um, for young Russian to become politically engaged, either to become a part of the system that we criticize, or to go outside to the streets, like many of my friends, they went to Bolotnaya Square. But the majority, let's say 90% of Russian students, they just don't care about, about what's happening. And this is the issue that Mr. Verdanian has already mentioned, the issue of culture. Does it really matter? Can we build um, an active uh, civil society in this country? under what we have and used to have in terms of history. Thank you. Well, so, so, so here's the, the, the if, I could, if I could respond to the, to the theme in a, in a, in a methodological spirit, it's, it's, uh, it's dangerous to reify a national culture. So take the example of Japan. We now think of the Japanese uh, as having a collectivist spirit. We know their life employment system. Uh, we think of them as largely passive and anti-conflictual. Now, but in the 1920s and 1930s, Japanese industrial relations were among the most conflictual and violent in the world. It's the same people. So what we retrospectively regard as the essence, as the inner nature of a people, often is the product of a historical circumstance and of a set of institutional arrangements. You say the majority of young Russians are passive, but uh, allow me the following institutional innovations. First, uh, create a multitude of these small and medium-sized businesses with access to advanced technology, knowledge, and practice. Engage civil society in the provision of public services. Establish some form of mandatory social service so that every young person who does not perform military service must perform social service. Establish a form of education that is oriented to analysis and problem solving and that uses information deeply and selectively as an instrument of analytic empowerment. And that approaches all received knowledge dialectically from contrasting points of view and then create political arrangements that uh, encourage uh, 
the engagement of the populace in political life, for example, through comprehensive national plebiscites or referenda. You'll then see a completely different nation. And the same people who you regarded as inherently passive will reveal a different aspect of their experience and of their capabilities. So uh, m my idea is that it is, by, it, it is by a series of institutional innovations that we can radically transform the national circumstance. In thinking of these innovations, we have, we have a problem because we, we are influenced by intellectual traditions such as Marxism, that lead us to associate profound change with wholesale or systemic change. So the idea is there are these big indivisible systems in history, like capitalism and socialism. Either you manage one of these systems, and then you have a reformist politics, or you substitute one system for another, and then you have a revolutionary change. But this idea is entirely false. There aren't these systems. That's not how structural change happens in history. Structural change is almost always fragmentary, piecemeal, and gradual. But it can nevertheless be radical in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. So the idea is that by having a vision of a direction, you can, you can advance in that direction through a series of fallible, piecemeal, but cumulative changes that can have a radical effect through their persistence. If I may just, I think it's very, you put, you're touching a very important point about the transformation. But if you look at transformation models, there's only four models of transformation, evolutionary, which is always a compromise and going slowly, and people complain it's going not enough quickly, is reformation, is inquisition, and revolution, okay? No other system which brings the changes. And I don't know, maybe you know more, you will tell us. In this case, Russia been in reformation between Peter the Great, you have lost more people complaining any time in the other time of the history of Russia because he was basically destroying the society, saying this is people who has a no, beer is wrong people. That's so why it was big revolutionary transformation for the society. It was very pain painful. We had the Inquisition by Stalin, who jumped Russia from one system to another level to another level, just putting Inquisition as a part of the driver of the transformation. And we had a revolution. Now, today in Russia, what kind of system you believe can be achieve, uh, implemented to achieve the result? Because what Putin trying to do, with all my uh, criticism, is evolutionary development, trying to do slowly development without being uh, big transformation without doing really fantastic, uh, serious reformation or revolutions. But do you think in Russia, like country with this whole history, can we do no evolutionary transformation, doing reforms with institutions, structural reforms? It needs to be pushed. It needs to be sometimes hard and sometimes very tough. You cannot, not everybody in society will accept this reformation because some people will say, we want to have a past, we, we have a past, like we've been in the Soviet system or employees, why we need to be penalized, not be paying now pension? Or some other elements of the rules will be losing some part of the privilege, how you can do reforms without uh, keeping, the, with the keeping all the groups of the key people in society more or less stable and not vulnerable? Is it possible to achieve or not? Especially in society like Russia, there is a lot of controversial groups exist inside of society. More question. I, for me, it's like the problem is in the, uh, when we just uh, think about strategy, we usually think in the terms of economic efficiency or you know, how to achieve development. But for me personally, and I, I think that uh, uh, the goal that probably could attract more people and be more fair is to achieve uh, uh, happiness, is to achieve uh, the involvement of people, to make every person a creator and participator of uh, his life and the life of his community and the country. So when we think about like achieving economic efficiency, we always think, okay, who achieved economic efficiency? China achieved economic efficiency that way. United States achieved economic efficiency in, in its way, and we try to replicate. And that's why people don't want to participate in that, because that's not about them. It's about some economic efficiency that they don't specially and specifically need. For example, I don't think that I 
uh, want to be a soldier of economic efficiency, like in general, uh, even if, uh, if Vladimir Putin is, uh, you know, doing that, and probably even if uh, that has um, some economic growth. And I think that's the main problem. So we're not thinking about happiness, and uh, we're not making the society contributors uh, of these changes. We're just making them soldiers of uh, our like ideas that are very traditional. I think, uh, just in response to these two, two, two interventions, uh, one thing is for, for the ruler to decide that the established blueprint has to be adjusted. And then he says, a little bit adjustment, but not too much because we don't want instability. So, as uh, Peter the Great or, or whatever. Uh, it's an entirely different thing to say, we don't know what the blueprint is, and we don't want blueprints. We want to create a society of people who can advance in the absence of blueprints, uh, and who can form their own blueprints from the bottom up. Uh, and that's a completely different project. And that project is, in a sense, a revolutionary project. But it's not revolutionary in the old systemic sense of Marxism. Uh, it's, it, 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 it can be piecemeal. It can go step by step and part by part. But it is nevertheless radical in its, in its direction. And that was the spirit of, of my suggestions. May I get back to your last remark? It's so typical for the discussion because change is always associated with the suffering of the small people. This is what we have experienced because we can only imagine that change is associated with a terrible development in society, with a crisis. And I strongly disagree from my own experience with working as an advisor of a prime minister. The same prime minister who deliberate, who after 12 hours of deliberation decided that our banking system needs 800 million euros as an umbrella guarantee of the state and had no troubles of conceiving of the capability of the state, again Austria, you know, half of Moscow, to come up with 800 million outside the budget. The next day, and this story was told to us when we were in Vienna on Sunday, responded to a priest who came to him and said, I have an idea and I have a program. I need 200,000 euros per year, and I take the most de deprivated 1,000 homeless in Austria off the street. He responded, we don't have the money in the budget. These are choices which we, which we make. These are not things which are enshrined in, nation, in, in natural science. And I think we have to have the courage to move ourselves exactly in the way you are describing beyond these this limits of imagination. 800 million, no problem. We, had, we don't have a budget with 800 million, you get it. The banking system should not be, uh, should not be worried. 200,000 per year to take 1,000 homeless people off the street, we don't have the money in the budget. I mean, this is more than implementing it. May I make like a short intrusion? Uh, regarding those uh, issues of development, uh, how should we design the development? In my opinion, there is also one uh, thing which we have to consider, who are those stakeholders who decide? And uh, this Leo's example is uh, great, uh, showing that uh, those people who are in charge of decision making uh, how to promote development and how and which mode of development to choose, they sometimes uh, kind of you know risk averse in sense of innovation because they they don't really want to feel themselves in a position of instability uh, of future change because if you have revolutionary shift 
let's say, from capitalism to communism, then you have stakeholders who would benefit and who know, for them it's predictable, uh, what would be their position after this transformation. When Soviet Union was collapsing and the system was transforming through this massive privatization, there were stakeholders who did benefit from this. So they were, uh, let's say, part of Soviet nomenclature who did got uh, private property through this privatization process. So they consider themselves in a better position after the massive privatization. So they were stakeholders who were benefiting from uh, this kind of transformation. But in your suggestion, when your transformation is kind of unpredictable because it's experimental and you encourage the only thing is experimentalism itself, so then who would the uh, beneficiaries of this, uh, of this process, of this type of development. Only those people who would be more creative in a process, only those people who would be good in uh, doing stuff, you know, but you don't have predictable results, so you cannot basically like it with investment. If you, if you invest they're coming and saying, I want to invest this money with certain profit. Uh, so you have to show cash flow, I don't know, business plan, stuff like this. In case your investor come and say, uh, I want to invest your money with unpredictable result, but possibly it would be a really great uh, return. So it's type of venture capitalist investment, but it's a specific sphere. It's not like how uh, major investment uh, works, you know. So uh, it's, a sp it's a kind of unique and uh, to a certain extent marginal uh, s marginal part of investment process. So same thing with uh, uh, political and social change. If you uh, encourage government, let's say Putin himself, to uh, introduce such a way of reform, of reformation, of change, which would not be predictable to him personally and to the group related, affiliated to him as a uh, in, in power, being in power, then why would he uh, choose this? Why he would uh, opt in? You know, he would say, it's not predictable. Why? Why should I decide? Tell me what would be returned. Tell me what be the would be the profit for us as an establishment or for the vast majority if we're looking for support of this vast majority. In any case, you have to show the result. In your suggestion, I would say it looks like stakeholders, political stakeholders, should be too brave to dare to, you know, to, 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 to launch the process with unpredictable results. How would you solve this contradiction? I, uh, I don't think that the issue is it being predictable or not predictable. The issue is it being more exclusive socially or more inclusive socially. So there is, for every transition, for every transformation, there is always a path of least resistance. There's always the path that is the easiest path. Uh, and it is the easiest because it is the one that imposes the least disturbance on the established structure of dominant interests and dominant ideas. So take the uh, transition in the paradigm of production, the, uh, the substitution of Fordist mass production by so-called post-Fordist or flexible production. The easiest form of the transition is the one that contains the advanced form of production in isolated sectors, like the Silicon Valleys, because it is the least threatening to the established interest and to the established ideas. Uh, now, why do we have thought and politics in the world? We have thought and politics, always, to create an alternative to the path of least resistance. If, if, if the object is only uh, to uh, open this path of least resistance, we don't need to think, and we don't need to have political activity. The world takes care of itself. It reproduces itself. We have thought and we have politics so that there be some alternative to this simple reproduction of the existing world with all the risks that are entailed. Uh, and. Uh, the benefit, the promise, is, is this greater inclusion, this greater empowerment of those who would otherwise be passive. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, just one short remark, just to continue this uh, track. Uh, I clearly uh, fully understand, I think, the idea of 
being more dynamic and change and to create uh, certain alternatives as social beneficial beneficial way of development it's it's kind of understandable but what is uh, my concern actually uh, is a practical implementation of this mode through the system of current stakeholding uh, what I'm saying for example when we uh, try to introduce a new regime of intellectual property regulation uh, here in Russia and uh, to, to develop a global agenda of change. So we started to discuss with current stakeholders, political stakeholders and economic stakeholders, uh, what is a um, good way to reform, to liberalize the uh, system of intellectual property. And basically our idea was quite simple, very straightforward. Let's make uh, the framework more flexible. Let's uh, allow people to innovate in easier, uh, in in more relaxed environment. Because innovation is all about you know new ideas and uh, creation of uh, new knowledge and everything. So, if you um, make system more relaxed, more flexible, as you said, institutionally minimalized then you will have more opportunities for innovation. That was a message we, we brought, we, we put on the table. But uh, the, the response we've got was really simple. They said, uh, please count, count particular economic effects like money, amount of money, which Russian economy would get if you implement these changes. And they said, please consider this uh, cost, please make this cost-benefit analysis, this assessment of impact of your reformation for particular sectors of Russian economy with consideration of tax benefits for government and uh, uh, business uh, profits and so on. So uh, please show us not the process but the effect of the process. And when you have to introduce a reform considering the effects, so you're losing this experimental uh, drive, you're basically losing the opportunity to bring... So, no, okay, wait. Well, there, there, are t there, there are basically two answers to this line of reasoning. The first answer is that every transformative project in the world has to create its own constituency so that the interests that support it don't pre-exist the transformative project. They are the creation of the transformative project. You create your own stakeholders by changing the institutional design. And the second answer is that a capability is always more important than an immediate outcome. A capability to create more outcomes. No, but isn't the correct answer to the question Hollywood? Hollywood wouldn't exist. No. Hollywood wouldn't exist now if there would have been a rigid time of uh, a system of, of intellectual property at the time when when the big boom in filmmaking happened in the uh, in uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States. Or isn't the correct answer the vast uh, the vast uh, uh, industry of creativity in Japan? So this would be an answer which kind of describes a short-term uh, outcome. But isn't the important answer creativity and people who develop their personality? I mean, these questions, I know they're always framed in fancy theories, but it's the bankruptcy of politics or the business school. I uh, just want to say that it's understandable uh, those examples of uh, beneficial effect of uh, certain transform transformative actions, it's understandable. It's understandable for you know general public, for academics, and so on. But when you approach particular exact stakeholders who currently, currently getting hit their rent from the from the existing established uh, uh, system, so they would address you in a very practical, pragmatic way to say, hey, you want to introduce new change what would be our stake, what would be our return exactly from this transformation. You say, okay, Hollywood was established in early uh, 20th century because of a flexible uh, system of intellectual property which existed in the United States, absence of system of intellectual property or relaxed system, like uh, uh, very, very, very new. So, okay, but they say, are we in the same position as Hollywood was in that time? Uh, what industries do we have here with such a potential of growth? Please count all this thing. Bring us data and show, because every 
all political decisions here in Russia, at least. I'm not sure how it works in US right now, uh, but here in Russia, they all want to be technocratic in sense to apply methods of analysis and prediction of political decisions, Understood. which would show costs and benefits Understood. of those. But, but it's, but it's, it's really a very simple point. No, no structural change in the world can be uh, generated simply by a negotiation among insiders. So every structural change requires a com a, the, the combination of an attempt to divide the insiders and then to ally some of the out insiders with outsiders. What's Otherwise, the there's no structural change. What's the leverage? How to divide insiders? What sh what, I mean, you have to be super insider or something. I don't know, uh, for example, uh, we have a business people in a room. We have uh, young activists in a room. We even uh, have like uh, we uh, uh, Alexander who was sitting. He was like kind of high uh, governmental official. Uh, but to be honest, most of people here in Russia don't really have resource to promote political uh, agenda if you don't uh, negotiate it with the strong insiders. And I'm not sure that a different case in. United States or Europe. I, I mean, of course, it's great. It, it's a great deal to go to the parliament and say, you know what, it's a social demand, let's in, in, implement this law. But uh, the parliament consists of stakeholders who are related to the existing system. And uh, I don't see mechanism to implement this type of uh, visionary experimental agenda inside of the systems. And it's revolution, but in a revolution, you always have your stakeholders who would benefit afterwards. So just practical question. Is any, maybe, I don't know, maybe you see the point how to, how to introduce change. But how, does, but, but, but how has change ever happened in the world? In, in, in way, way before the contemporary democracies, in all the imperial and autocratic states of antiquity, change happens because there's a struggle among the elites, and some of the elites then appeal to the outsiders against their enemies within the elite. That's how change happens. Great, but then huh? this part of elite, which uh, is contributing to the change, so they, they have to see their stakes. So I understand this point, because when Peter the Great initiated his reforms, he was a kind of outsider to the established system of uh, hierarchy of, of, uh, of arist aristocrats. Uh, and his team, his supporters, they were outsiders uh, to those uh, rent seekers of the old uh, medieval elite uh, of Russia. And when he got leverage, being a part of the elite, of course, he was a Tsar. But when he got leverage and his team got leverage to change something, he started this because he saw uh, those uh, uh, benefits for himself and his uh, uh, guys uh, after the reform would be implemented. Uh, I understand when Soviet nomenclature initiated mass privatization, for me, it's clear when you have opportunity to transform uh, massive uh, uh, state-owned property into private property, keeping your control over it, it's clear why you do it. Uh, it's clear for me why uh, current uh, government uh, initiated the process of uh, you know, uh, bigger government in, in impact uh, on economy because they control mostly government, not economy, so to use their leverage as a government people. But when you approach now, let's say, Putin, uh, hypothetically, and uh, let's imagine he's sitting over here, so, and say, uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich, we want to implement this change. Who would be your supporter inside? And how would you persuade your supporter? You have to say, your stake in change would be this and that. To show him or her the stake, you have to count. So to, how, to count, you have to implement certain a method of counting, so cost-benefit analysis. When you implement this, you're losing leverage for, as you said, experimental uh, reform, reformism, because your experimental reformism is based on the absence of an exact instrumental, I don't know, method of implementation of this uh, reform. You have to count some of the things and some of the people who were not counted before. And the, 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 the characteristic psychology of transformation 
involves combining being an insider with being an outsider. Just the very last comment on the thing you were talking about. Um, well, we're, we're currently sitting right nearby the Federal Security Service, so I want to be cautious about my comments. Um, but still, uh, you said that there, are, there is an opportunity to, for changes if two elites are striving for, let's say, two in two different directions. So this is the first opportunity. The second opportunity for a change is when we have a strong civil society. When we don't have a strong civil society, the government, when there is no balance between the government and civil society, we don't have this strive for change. You are absolutely right about the idea that we need uh, a different type of education. That's what I believe in. We need to have students who are able to cr think critically uh, but we don't have them, and we will, we won't have those students because the government is not willing to change the system. This is uh, what I believe is the major problem, and we don't have people who are ready to go out and to protest and to say we need a different system for higher education. And this is why I believe this is just uh, an infinite circle, and we just cannot get out of it. Thank you. Uh, working in Sberbank, it's the uh, biggest bank in Russia. My question is about the Brazil. You have a big problem, the drug. And uh, I listened that it was this, some initiative of your, your president to legalize the drug in Brazil. If we are talking about the uh, changes, and uh, how the decision-making process in your government will go if you will decide to legalize the drug, maybe fire a lot of policemen and they will come, uh, businessmen and will start their own business. So big amount of money in your budget that you're spending for fight against the drug. And it will change the world. And uh, every time when we are talking about the changes, you have to make about the big changes. Uh, it was one interesting story in, in, in Singapore when uh, one of the Russian businessmen, um, he opened the business in Singapore and the tax inspection came to him. He was a little bit afraid and they checked him about two months and after this tax inspection, make him the offer. They said, we will invest money in your business if you will increase the number of your employees and we'll, in the research center. Because they calculate that it will bring more benefit for the country. It's different psychology, different psychology to legalize the drugs. A big changes. It's uh, it's not only the some reforms. Uh, it's the decision making process. I'm more interesting about how the decision making process like this uh, will be in Brazil in your government. How it's going to inside your country, if you will decide to legalize the drug, for example. Sure, I understood the question. Uh, um, uh, I had a meeting with the Princess Marble. She knows that you're president. And she said that she knows about the uh, initiatives that in the hand of your president to legalize the drug in your country. It's, it's not a big issue in Brazil. It's a big issue in Mexico, but it's not a central issue in Brazil. Maybe. Uh, we have many other problems. Okay. Uh, Which type of problem, the big problem you have, for example, the biggest problem in Brazil? The biggest, that prob the biggest problem that we have is like the biggest problem in the United States. So, Brazil is the country in the world that is most like the United States. So it's a, a country of identical size with the United States, established on the same basis of European settlement and African slavery. It's the most unequal of country of its type in the world, as the United States is the most unequal of the rich industrial democracies. And paradoxically, in these two very unequal societies, the majority of ordinary people continue to believe that everything is possible in the midst of this tremendous inequality. And the, the fundamental problem that we have is that there's this seething cauldron of creativity, of vitality. Millions of people are struggling to open and maintain small businesses. 
and they lack the basic equipment of economic and educational opportunity. So that this vast human energy is wasted. That's the tragedy of the society. Uh, and that's what we have to correct through uh, structural transformation. That's the important issue in the society. Everything else is secondary. Professor Unger, I wanted to thank you for setting up uh, four uh, key topics for discussion, which uh, generated a very uh, heated debate. Um, my name is Alex Lupichev, and I represent Skolko Foundation. And I wanted to explore the connection or disconnect between two topics which you mentioned. One is uh, national development policy as a priority, and the other is uh, uh, international institutions and regulations. Our, what we see is uh, that uh, uh, national development policy is, is, is uh, uh, limited to the boundaries of a national state, which, was, uh, uh, which appeared in a few hundred years ago. We inherited it from tsars and kings, if you are talking about Europe. On the other hand, we have very powerful international undercurrents, like uh, globalization of finance, multinational corporations, and more recently, internet as uh, the common uh, medium for communication and English as a common language. So my question is probably a little bit naive, but what are the chances that uh, the national state as a concept survives the 21st century? How much energy should we put into developing national strategy as opposed to regional or supranational strategy? Thank you. Well, this is in a sense a philosophical question, right? So uh, I, I believe that humanity develops its powers only by developing them in different directions. So uh, humanity becomes unified by becoming different. And the role of nation states in the world is to represent different ways of being human, translated into institutional, distinctive institutional orders. And therefore, I want a world order that is hospitable to difference and that doesn't impose a uniform blueprint upon humanity. Uh, and I, uh, I think that in this respect, Russia is in a very peculiar position because Russia is accustomed to think of itself as a great power and it is one of the victorious powers that emerged from the Second World War. Uh, and so it is reluctant to turn against this order that was established by the great powers in the aftermath of the war. But I uh, myself believe that, that, that the, the much deeper interest of Russia is in associating itself with the emergent powers in the world to create an order that is more open to deviation than the order established after the Second World War. But this is, this, this, this is an ambivalence that Russia would have to resolve. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I'm representing the uh, strategy, strategy department of one of metals mining company. And uh, I have a question, maybe just uh, I will express my point of view and ask my questions just a bit later. But before asking, uh, I would let me give you a case. So uh, we were we made a kind of research uh, on the speeches of our ruling, how to say, uh, ruling people. And uh, about 30 years ago, in 1981, there was a meeting uh, of Communist Party, and uh, the speech of the leader um, consists of uh, such a statements: so that we need to increase productivity. We need to find another resources for growth. We need to solve uh, transport system, the bottlenecking, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, in 2011, we had a speech of Mr. Putin, who was actually repeating the same statements. So uh, what a conclusion we made. We have uh, not a lack of ideas in which way to develop. We have a really lack of implementation of our ideas. And uh, so we ask uh, ourselves why. Just uh, because we have no institutions which are working, really working to implement these reforms, these ideas. And we ask ourselves, okay, if it doesn't work, it, it needs to be uh, reformed. 
and who will be how to say um, who will be the driver of uh, these uh, reforms for the institutions as we see now that um, you know like uh, the bottom level the how to say uh, the bottom le- the bottom level of people have limited uh, voice to to reform something and uh, the top uh, level of people uh, leading our country have uh, lack of motivation to transform the existing system what uh, could be the trigger for reforms what's your opinion right the trigger for reform. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an idea about the national future. Uh, the, the, this is what modern politics is about. It's some, it's, some, it's, some, it's some conception about how the nation can be developed, the national project can be affirmed. Uh, that connects with the interests of the majority. So it's, it's, there, there, there are these two sides. There's, there's the idea of the affirmation of national power or of the national project. And then there's the development of a form of life that can be sustained within the country by a majoritarian coalition. Now, you said in your remark that uh, we have ideas, but we can't implement them. I entirely disagree with you. I think that what we least have are ideas. Okay, my name is Sergey Oksaninov. It's a great honor to be here and discuss topics with you. I'm from Fukuoka School of Business, and I have the following question. In the 1990s, uh, Harvard professor Jeffrey Sachs came here to um, coach Russian government on how to um, proceed with the shock therapy. And the shock therapy was something that was first tried in post-war Germany. And, okay, maybe, maybe it's one, one thing of viewing that. But I'm not sure it was ethical to implement the same, the same approach which worked in the post-war Germany and in the Transfer, transforming Russia and giving the fact of those tremendous social movements back then, are we past dependent to fail by implementing uh, different blueprints? It was a blueprint against the blueprint, but not the direction. So how, how would you what would be your advice on how to formulate a direction for Russia rather than uh, different blueprints that compete against each other, internal versus external, uh, revolutionary versus uh, evolutionary, and so on? What would be your advice on that direction? I've, I've stated my position in this, in this conversation. So the, the, uh, my view is that our countries, thinking of myself now as a, as a Brazilian, that, that our countries should not simply imitate the institutional arrangements that prevail in the North Atlantic world. Our, our interest is to reinvent the institutional form of the market, of democracy, and of civil society. Uh, uh, we, we, we cannot resolve the basic problems of our societies within this narrow repertory of institutional debate that exists in the North Atlantic. Today, in the North Atlantic world, the, the political horizon is limited to the attempt to reconcile European-style social protection with American-style economic efficiency within the limits of the, institutional, of the institutional compromise of the mid-20th century. We can't resolve our problems within those limits. 
So it's, it's about challenging the limits and establishing. It's uh, it's it's about it's it's about radically expanding the range of institutional alternatives. Um, my name is Dmitry, and I work with uh, Ruben and Gore at uh, Sberbank. Um, uh, you started with the, the four areas. Maybe it's worth finishing with them as well. Um, what are key successes of Brazil in these areas, and uh, that and Russia maybe could uh, share positive experience uh, from Brazil in these areas? You know, uh, uh, Brazil is in is is in fashion in the in the world debate, but I'm not a defender of any Brazilian model, and I don't believe. A Brazilian model exists under under our recent governments. We uh, democratized access to consumption uh, through a rise in the nominal wage, conditional cash transfer programs, and uh, a broader access to consumer credit. So. The economy was democratized on the demand side, but it was not democratized on the supply side. And the basic problem of the, of the society is that this, this very dynamic population with a, a multitude of, of millions of, of small-time enterprises, initiatives, has no access to economic or educational opportunity. Uh, this failure of ours has been masked by the boom in commodity prices, uh, the, the, the use of established comparative advantage. But we now have this fundamental task of transforming the structure. And I would like to think that that's a task that we share with Russia. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, colleagues, that you came. Uh, once again, I would say that uh, come to Discussion Society or Harvard Club of Russia. We have a lot of events uh, upcoming and uh, such great speakers as Professor Unger. I see how vibrant and intensive our debates are. Uh, and uh, thank you for support of Duke uh, University Fuqua School of Business uh, of this event and uh, Global Shapers community. Yeah, I always like Miss Shakers, Shapers. It's, it's strange, actually. I, I, I perceive that young people should be Shakers, not Shapers. Because shapers should be like uh, uh, forming, norming, and performing. Uh, but shaking is, be, is before, is before forming. Yeah. Shake, shaking is the presupposition of shaping. Yeah, of shaping, yeah. yeah. I think uh, we need more Shakers, not yeah. Shapers. <laughs> to more something. And shapers, shapers go exactly the direction of constant <laughs> innovation that you described. Yeah. Okay, uh, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Unger. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to, to the Duke Club of Russia.